All right, what's going on guys? This is Rob and we are back. Yes, we are. We're continuing our coverage of getting caught up on X-Men and we're picking up with Cable. Now, here's the thing. This Cable story is fun. It's amazing. I absolutely love this Cable story. And, and to be honest with you guys, I've always kind of loved the Cable stories more recently with the younger Cable as opposed to the older Cable, mostly because I read the older Cable for so long. I just kind of got tired of reading him. <laughs> this grizzled old man who just kind of ends up in some weird escapades and stuff. I will say the Cable and Deadpool series was amazing, but nonetheless. So what this does is this picks up in the aftermath of young Cable basically defeating uh, Wolverine in the quarry, right? The quarry is kind of the testing, right? Where everything goes down and, and mutants can face off against each other, different things like that. In all honesty, it makes perfect sense that young Cable would beat Wolverine. I mean, old Cable would crush Wolverine. Young Cable is enough to hold his own against Wolverine, right? Just kind of the experience and so on because he comes from a war-torn age, right? Comes from the future where basically it's nonstop war and survival of the fittest where Apocalypse had basically conquered everything. But in the midst of all this, he's actually met by the arrival of a young mutant named Curse, who basically says that that Curse and a friend had essentially kind of gone too close to a territory where the monsters dwell, right? Which is kind of a, a, a sort of off-limits place for young mutants that only adults are really allowed to go there. But the cool thing about this is that it focuses on, you know, them arriving there, and then this giant, you know, lion thing just kind of runs awry. And there's not a whole lot to speak of here. It's kind of like, you know, Cable, like, you know, get him out of here, and he kind of gets overwhelmed a little bit, and, you know, this, this younger mutant's talking about how it's experiencing pain and all that kind of stuff. And so what ends up happening is that once this, you know, really once Cable's almost kind of incapacitated and armor comes to his aid, that he realizes the pain this mutant was talking about was not some kind of spiritual or emotional pain. It was a literal pain, right? There's a thing stuck in its foot. And so what ends up happening is they basically topple this, this giant, you know, monster thing and Cable pulls whatever's stuck only to find out that it's basically a sword. And as soon as that happens, he's met by this kind of surge of psychic energy and then basically passes out. And he ends up having this vision of what is a space knight. Now, space knights are really, really cool concepts, right? The Galadorian space knights, these are really awesome. Rom is the most popular of all the space knights, but I'm pretty sure Marvel doesn't own the rights to Rom anymore. The idea behind this is that the space knights were at one point humans. And the way it was done is it was kind of a badge of honor to a degree. A person could have their consciousness put in a cybernetic body. And so basically it would be a human brain in a, in a robotic body where they basically be a cyborg and they would go forward as protectors. Now the space knights were wildly capable and they were pretty powerful for quite some time. During the events of, uh, of Annihilation Conquest, they were basically taken over by Ultron when he tried to conquer the universe. And then you go into what is basically the War of the Builders during Jonathan Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers, where the world of the Galadorian space knights, the planet Galador itself, was totally destroyed. So for the most part, there aren't really any space knights anymore. But for this particular guy, he ended up stumbling across what was basically Earth on the nation of Arako before it split between Arako and Krakoa uh, in the distant past and it ended up coming across this giant lion thing and then in the fight of course this guy was destroyed but his sword was stuck in the foot of the lion and it's been there basically ever since. Now on the surface it's like okay cool whatever a sword right this takes place before the events of Ten of Swords so that's why it's here is because it'll go on to be an important part of the Ten of Swords event but the reason why this is so important is because what you actually end up doing is transitioning to a place off Earth right basically the Museum of Lost Civilizations, and you've got three space knights who are there, all of which basically activate. They kind of kick into existence and then move forward, right? They were largely believed to have been dead because they had just kind of been found floating out there and then they were just, you know, seemed to be shut down. But once they activate, that's when they basically take off and start beelining towards Earth. Now, something else that goes on here, and this is something that I want to kind of throw out there, it's, it's kind of an on-running plot thread, kind of a lower plot thread, something that'll be explored later on, is basically a mutant baby went missing, right? And you end up finding out this mutant baby was basically stolen by what were essentially the neighbors who were part of the Order of X, right? The, the uh, I guess the group in humanity, a kind of cult that basically worships mutants, believing they can become mutants. They see mutants as gods and they, see, they do all kinds of crazy stuff, sacrifices, things like that. They carve an X onto their face. So that's kind of it, you know, going on with, with that whole thing. Not a whole lot going there. Cable kind of joins the investigation for a little bit. Um, and then you actually end up having this instance where Cyclops follows up after Nathan to meet with a couple of the cops. This is a cool moment. Normally we would ignore this, but it's it's kind of a cool moment. The reason why is because after he's done talking to these cops and they leave, Emma Frost comes storming in, right? And she's mad. And the reason why is because basically Cable's banging all the Stepford cuckoos. He's dating them all. <laughs> the Stepford cuckoos are basically clones of Emma Frost. So imagine if you were dating like six Emma Frost and that's basically what he's doing, right? But at the same time, they're also kind of messing with Cable a little bit, right? But Emma Frost kind of chastises Cyclops a little bit. And it's like, look, you know, make sure he doesn't break their hearts. But if but basically, if he wants to get with all my daughters, sure, right? 
right, just, you know, let that thing out. It's kind of, it's kind of weird. As I say that, it's kind of weird and a little messed up, right? But the important thing behind this is that once you pick back up with, with younger Cable again in their investigations, one of the things that ends up happening is their hunt for, you know, this, this young girl and so on. He actually ends up taking Esme, who's the step for Kaku at the time, who's his girlfriend. Uh, he ends up taking her basically to, to the house and they're kind of investigating and she picks up on a couple of things. And then the, the Galdorian space knights arrive out of nowhere, blow the place up, knock them unconscious and then leave, right? End up taking uh, Cable and Esme with them and then take them basically to the North Pole. And that's when you get this really interesting situation, right? Where Cable himself has never really encountered the Galadorian Space Knights or any variation of them before. And truth to tell, most people haven't, right? Most members of the superhero community have never really encountered Space Knights. Some have, but it's usually only the spacefaring ones, right? When Iron Man was part of the Guardians of the Galaxy, Richard Rider Nova, right? Like Peter Quill as Star-Lord. There's only precious few. Whenever the X-Men have taken off into space and encountered them, but most people have never met them, right? They've fought alongside them maybe a couple times, but by and large, most folks aren't really aware of these guys' existence. And the big question they have here is how is Cable able to wield the, the Light of Galador, as they call it, right? The sword that has the power to restore the Galadorian homeworld. And so that's when you end up finding out where Cable kind of tries to bargain with them for a minute. That's when you end up finding out their intention, they can't really bring back their world in the traditional sense. Instead, they're going to terraform Earth. It'll take millennia for it to happen, but they're going to terraform the Earth and they're going to annihilate anybody who stands in their way. Now, in reality, these guys have no idea what they're doing, right? These Galadorian knights, these, these guys have no clue what they're doing. Like, you're talking about a world with that has at least five people that I can count on one hand who can alter reality on a universal scale. These guys aren't stopping anything. But for the sake of the story, <laughs> these guys are convinced they can. And that's when Cable actually chimes in and says, wait a minute, wait a minute. You guys said you can't restore your world. And they said, yes. He's like, but what if I told you you could? And they said, that's not possible. We would need a time machine. And so ultimately what we end up realizing here is that younger Cable intends to grab the time travel device of his older Cable counterpart, right? His older self, and then give that to those guys so they can travel back to their own history and basically save their world during the conflict of the builders. Now, the funny thing about this and what Cable doesn't even really know here is that's never going to succeed, right? Even Cable was not part of, of Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers run. He wasn't there during the battle of, uh, you know, with the builders and everything where the Avengers were basically fleeing for their lives. And the only way they could win was by basically releasing the annihilation wave, right? Like just basically the force of energy that almost destroyed the entirety of the universe. They have to release that in order to win. Nonetheless, the question they have is where's old Cable buried at, right? And so once they get the location, they end up realizing that basically old Cable's body's missing. And then they end up seeing what is basically a bag that had Mexican food in it, right? Staten Island's finest Mexican cuisine. And you guys know what that means. Where there's Cable, there's chimichangas. And where there's chimichangas, there's Deadpool. <laughs> <laughs> so they end up tracking down Deadpool, who of course, in his own stories, is now the king of Staten Island, which is pretty amazing. And it's kind of funny because remember, Cable and Deadpool have a very lengthy history together. I mean, their history goes all the way back to the first introduction of Deadpool in Marvel Comics, who was initially a mercenary, and then ultimately they ended up forming a friendship, which was like a buddy cop comic, one of the best comics Marvel ever released. It was absolutely hilarious. I loved Cable and Deadpool. But nonetheless, right, because there's a history there, it makes sense that Deadpool would actually steal the body of his best friend and then give it a proper burial as opposed to it just being dropped off in, in you know, some field somewhere or some, some cemetery somewhere to basically be forgotten. And so it was kind of this funny thing because young Cable despises Deadpool and Deadpool's like, you know, your hatred, it's a good start, but you can hate me so much more, man. You gotta try better. <laughs> I love seeing that, right? Like Deadpool's one of those characters, I could take him in small doses. Sometimes I absolutely despise how he's written and other times I think he's hilarious. This is one of those times where I think he's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> because I guess Jerry Dugan just has a great way of writing Deadpool. But ultimately, he ends up taking, you know, Cable and the Galadorians and, and uh, Esme and kind of takes them to where Cable's buried. And initially, you think the whole thing is supposed to be some kind of big tomb, right? Because they're literally walking down like this stone corridor. So he's like, you know, like behind this, you know, if you're, if you're ready for this, right behind this is where you're buried. Only to find out, it's like an amazing room, right? There's like pictures of hot girls on the wall and like his guns are like, it's like literally spray painted my guns. <laughs> there's like, there's like space invaders, you know, and like, like just arcades and like a big pool table, which actually contains Cable himself, but it's like the best place to have your tomb at. You know what I mean? Like it's the most Cable place ever. It's absolutely awesome. And so one of the funny things is like, like Deadpool's like, okay, cool. So, you know, if we're going to do this, we got to play some pool and whoever, whoever wins ends up getting the body. So he's like, I'm going to put my balls on your face cable. And then Cable's just like, Bow! and just like smashes the glass, right? And then like snatches up the arm and then basically just leaves. <laughs> 
<laughs> just ends up walking away. Now, as far as what goes on here with these Space Knights, this is one of the cool things because Jerry Dugan actually shifts up a lot of the stuff that we're familiar with. And what he basically says here is that under normal circumstances, Galadorian Space Knights were honorable people who had their brains put in machine bodies so they could be what was in effect eternal protectors of their race. I mean, they wouldn't really last for eternity, but much longer than their mortal bodies would normally last. What you also ended up finding is that there was a dark side to the Galadorian mythos. And what you had were basically the dark Galadorian knights. These were guys who were criminals. They were guys who broke laws, different things like that, murderers and so on and so forth, thieves. And what would happen is that they would basically be conscripted. They would have their brains forcefully removed from their bodies and then put in space knight, uh, space knight suits. And then they would have to go forward as members of the Galadorian space knight community. The difference is that they would tell them once you basically complete your task, then you'll be given a full pardon. The reality is that once they completed whatever their objective was supposed to be, they'd be brought back, decommissioned, and their brains would be destroyed. So it's a pretty shady thing to do, right? A pretty terrible thing to do. Now, some of these Galadorian knights didn't realize what was going on, right? Some of these dark Galadorians didn't know what was happening, and they would hope that maybe there was some kind of circumstance that led to some of those guys being decommissioned, and their circumstance would be different, which it never was. Some of the other guys, like these three, uh, Tark, Brock, and Kron, they actually bailed out. They, they abandoned Galador in its entirety. Instead, what they were doing is they were constantly on the hunt for the for the light of Galador, the sword of Galador. The biggest problem here is that during this time, because of the fact that so much time had passed and because they knew that they would kind of have to stay in stasis for prolonged periods of time. So basically they would hunt for 10 years, sleep for a thousand years, hunt for 10 years, sleep for a thousand years, different things like that. All under the auspices that because the universe is going to last for an exceedingly long amount of time, they basically got plenty of time to find the sword. That during the time when they were sleeping, Galador was destroyed during the battle with the builders. And that's why these guys are here, right? That's why they're here because they were basically in stasis and hidden away. Not only that, the crazy thing about that is it's not just these three. There's actually others. There's lots of others, all of whom are basically recalled here under the pretense that they'll be given time travel technology by cable and they'll be given the ability to go back in time. Now, in all honesty, because they'd be basically given free reign of the time stream, they would most likely go back to, to the earliest days of the Galadorian Empire, conquer it, and then make themselves rulers and then rebuild the whole thing in their own image. But the cool thing about this is that as Cable is basically opening this arm of his older self and kind of analyzing it, the whole thought here is we need to sabotage the time machine, right? Like we need to destroy these guys. We can't just let these guys go back in time because who knows what might happen, right? We can't give villains access to the time stream because God only knows what they'll do. He's like, so maybe there's something that I can do, some way that I can sabotage this. So he closes it, opens it back up, and there's a bomb in place of what was the time travel device. And that's one of the cool things that goes on is because what you end up realizing here is that in the future, when younger Cable had destroyed his older self, that the way this played out is that his older self realized that this bomb was going to be needed at some point in time, right? Old Cable knew his destruction at the hands of his younger self was inevitable. There was not going to be any way to stop it. And so in order to allow that to happen, or in order to ensure his younger self survives to grow up and become his older self, he basically replaces time travel device with a bomb. And that's why when younger Cable killed older Cable, older Cable didn't just body slide. He didn't just teleport away, which is what he would normally do, right? Body slide by one to HQ and then just disappear and live to fight another day. Instead, he had to die in order to ensure his younger self could live. And that's what younger Cable realizes. And so with this bomb basically being activated and being hidden away, these guys not knowing what's going on, they start to realize like, hey, like our sensors are picking up some kind of plutonium and Cable's like, no, 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 no. It's good guys. Uh, time travel devices need a source of plutonium. And they're like, we've been deceived. And like they immediately attack Cable. <laughs> They immediately gun for him the whole time. The bomb's going off, right? The Krakoan gate's been opened by Esme to basically give them a way to leave because they're quite literally stranded out in the middle of nowhere. And of course, Cable uses his telekinesis to, to summon the sword back to himself, leave these guys stranded. And as the bomb goes off, they're all basically destroyed. Cable keeps the sword and passes through the Krakoan gate to go back to Krakoa again. And so it's kind of a funny thing because when they land there, of course, Emma Frost is waiting on them. And then like, Cable's like, okay, cool. It was awesome hanging out, Esme. It was a cool date. Uh, Tell Phoebe that I'm excited to see her tomorrow because I'm basically banging you and all your sisters. But, uh, but yeah, you know, let me, let me know. And then Emma Frost is like, I'm watching you. <laughs> 
So here's the thing. Like once Cable gets back home, <laughs> everything's kind of cool, right? Everything sort of calms down. You got him talking to Cyclops and his dad and so on and so forth. And they're all just kind of hanging out and doing their thing. But it's a cool little story, guys. I loved it, man. Now think about this. This goes directly into the Ten of Swords event, right? Which is how it explains that Cable got this sword in the first place. And then following this, of course, we'll probably go into uh, Cable Volume 2, which is post Ten of Swords, which is pretty cool. But with that being said, guys, we're gonna bring this to an end. Thank you guys for watching and I will catch you all later. Peace.